Richard has a brilliant insight. Even before Darwin came along and gave us the answer, the impotence of the argument from design was glaring. How could it ever have been a good idea to postulate as an explanation for the existence of complex, improbable things, a designer who would have to be even more complex and improbable than that which he's being invoked to explain? The entire argument is an obvious logical non-starter. That is brilliant. Richard has just put his finger on the most important point that has run through this series so far. And the implication of what he is saying is that these guys might be the most intelligent and rational people on the planet. In order to see why, we need to examine his argument. Richard here is not making an argument, he's responding to an argument. The argument that he's responding to looks something like this. This isn't a formal argument, it's just a thought process, but I'm just going to put it up here so we can organize our thoughts and see clearly what he is saying. So he says that someone who believes in God, based on the argument from design, observes that the design in living things needs to be explained. Then they say that God fills that need and then Richard, he objects and he says, but then God also has that need. God also needs to be designed. So who designed God? So Richard is saying that you haven't done anything. You haven't solved the problem. That is a very brilliant insight. Richard is saying that if you take something that is in need and you use this thing that itself is in need to fulfill the need of something else, then you haven't done anything. This should remind you of the line of dominoes. One domino leaning against another domino, leaning against another domino, leaning against another domino. None of those dominoes do anything because every domino has a need. And as long as it needs something to keep it up, to prop it up, it cannot prop up anything else. Richard has just explained that the reason why the design argument doesn't work is because it doesn't prove the existence of someone who doesn't need anything. What do we call someone who doesn't need anything? We call him a necessary being. Richard is right. The design argument is a bad argument for the existence of God. The reason why the design argument doesn't work because it leaves open the question, who made God? The design argument is a God of the gaps argument. It says that science can't explain it, nature didn't do it, therefore God must have done it. And there are other kinds of God of the gaps, gaps arguments that are made by theists in our times, and all of them are susceptible to the same question, then who made God? Because they don't explain, they don't prove the existence of someone who does not need to be made the way that he is by anything else. I want you to see that these guys understand something about God that the design argument doesn't tell you. These guys understand that God does not need anything because they're using the argument from contingency even though they might not be able to articulate it. Now let's take Richard's insight and apply it to his own argument. He starts off the same way that the theists start off. He says that living things are in need of being designed. First step, the same. The second step is different because 
The theist will say that God fills that need. What does Richard say? Richard says, evolution fills that need. But the same critique that Richard made of the theistic argument for God can be made here for his argument for evolution. Who made evolution? Because evolution too is in need of being designed. Evolution is not a random process. Evolution results in magnificent complexity and that magnificent complexity is design so the thing that led to that complexity must be even more designed exactly as Richard said. So who made that? Just as in the design argument, the conception of God in the design argument didn't solve the problem. Evolution here does not solve the problem. Remember, something that itself is in need cannot fulfill the need of something else. So Richard will say, yes, evolution needs to be explained, but science will discover that explanation someday. That's the nature of science. There's always the great unknown for it to explore. But what will science discover? Science will give a natural explanation. What is a natural explanation? It's an explanation of things in the universe, in the natural world, with other things in the universe, in the natural world. But everything in the natural world is needy. It needs something to make it the way that it is. It's contingent. Atoms are contingent. Subatomic particles are contingent. Energy is contingent. Motion is contingent. Chemical reactions are contingent. All of these things that we use to explain the phenomena that we see around us are themselves the subjects and topics of scientific inquiry. And any explanation that we might find after them will be the same. Every scientific explanation, everything in the natural world is a domino. Scientific explanations are the stacking of one domino against another domino, against another domino, against another domino. They're all in need. They all have a need. They don't explain anything. Richard will not look at it this way. Richard will look at it like this. He'll say that Natural explanations are rational. Supernatural explanations, explanations of things in the universe without appealing to other things in the universe that we can touch, that we can infer through scientific experiment. Supernatural explanations are irrational. So he'll say that a natural explanation is rational. A supernatural explanation is irrational because it's like um, appealing to fairies, leprechauns. Remember the pig unicorn? <laughs> you guys who are watching are going to fall into one of two categories. One of you, one category, is going to say that why is Hamza just repeating himself again and again and again? <laughs> That's one category. And to this category, I'll tell you the reason why I'm repeating myself again and again and again is because of the second category. The second category of you are saying that, but supernatural, there's no evidence. Who made God? We're just going in circles. <laughs> We're just going in circles. I just explained why God doesn't need anything to make him exist. I just explained the evidence for the existence of that being. God is not like a fairy or a leprechaun or a pig unicorn. Those kinds of things are, don't have any evidence. The existence of God does have evidence. 
The argument for the existence of God is not a God of the gaps explanation. I've just explained that. And that's why I need to keep on going because I want you to understand this time. Guys, I want you to get it. Listen to me. So let's look at this idea that natural explanations are rational and supernatural explanations are irrational. So what's a natural explanation? A natural explanation is the observation of an association between contingent things. When you are observing, for example, a relation between the mass of an object, a large object, a sun, a planet, and its motion in space, then and you describe it using uh, gravitational attraction and uh, the laws of physics, what are you observing? You are observing in your natural explanation associations between contingent things in the universe. And when you appeal to evolution, you're doing the same thing. You're observing an association between survival pressures in the environment and between the the adaptation of living things to those survival pressures such as the, the development of resistance to antibiotics in bacteria that we observe all the time. So what is a natural explanation doing? It is describing associations between contingent things. But guys remember Pavlov's dogs also observed an association. They observed an association between the food and the ringing of the bell and they began salivating. Tell me, was their inference, their inference of causation saying that it's the bell that actually brings about the food? Tell me, was that a rational inference? You're going to say no, it wasn't because the only thing they observed was an association. And they didn't see beyond the association to see that Pavlov or whoever his assistant was, was placing this association there from above. They couldn't see beyond the association because dogs, they responded with their animal instinct. So guys, when we look at the same associations, in the movements of the planets, in the adaptations of living things, how do we make sure that we're not like those dogs? How do we make sure that we're not responding according to our animal instincts, that we're not just responding according to our conditioning? We use our mind. And when we use our mind, what do we see? We see one contingent thing, leaning on another contingent thing, leaning on another contingent thing, and so on. And we see that everything in the contingent universe depends on someone who doesn't need anything. That's what these guys realize. When they're prostrating, when they're worshipping, they are expressing their need, their utter need, to the only one who can fulfill that need, the one who doesn't need anything. So that's a natural explanation. So now you understand why natural explanations are not rational explanations. They're instinctive, animal instinct responses. What about supernatural explanations? Are they irrational? as Richard would say, as many atheists would say. Well, if we pulled them out of our hats, if we invented fairies and leprechauns and pig unicorns, <laughs> just like that, then yes, it would be an irrational explanation. It doesn't have any proof, but that's not what we're doing. That's not what we're doing. We have evidence that the explanation for all contingent phenomena is a supernatural explanation. And that supernatural explanation is not another contingent thing like a fairy 
a leprechaun, a pig unicorn, that supernatural explanation is something like we've never experienced. That thing is not made in the image of man. It's not a human being with a beard living on, on the top of a mountain. It's not something that we can imagine with our minds. It's not something that's a physical object. It doesn't have mass. It doesn't have energy. It's not described by time. It's not described by space. And everything that is described by space and time and mass and energy, everything that's this, the physical universe, it needs this thing that is completely different from it that doesn't need anything. This is not an easy concept to realize. For Muslims, it's easy. Why is it easy? Because when they worship God, when they prostrate to God, they break this animal instinct that we have with which we interact with the universe. This worship, this remembrance of God, it unconditions them. So this idea is easy for them to grasp. But if someone has never done that and they've spent their lives being conditioned by this thing does this thing and that thing does this thing and if I do this then I will achieve this goal and, and I'm the master of my fate and the captain of my soul and all of these, if this is the way that he's interacted with the universe for his entire life, then breaking that conditioning is not easy. It requires something of the mind. It requires a rational process like the one that I've just explained. But it also needs coming to terms with this reality. Coming to terms with this reality, with the conclusion of this argument, changes the way that you look at everything. These guys get it. These guys are rational. And when Richard asks who designed the designer, he commits himself to this same conclusion. Now, I've been a critic of the design argument and a number of you have felt sad because when you look at the design in the universe, you're amazed and it reminds you of the majesty of God. So in the next episode, I'm going to um, remove your sadness and show you that, yes, the design in the universe does reveal the majesty of God, even though it doesn't prove his existence, but it tells us something very important about him. If you benefited from this video, please help me spread this knowledge by liking this video, by subscribing to my channel, and by sharing this video with as many people as you can. You could change someone's life.